Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, sorry for our technical difficulties at the beginning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Peter Pfeiffer. Um, Peter is uh, new to our speaking uh, list. Uh, in a uh, early part of his career, he was a research biochemistry, a PhD in biochemistry, and he worked in uh, as a research biochemist for uh, some time, but then uh, did medicine and uh, into the latter part of his life, was a consultant anaesthetist at the Robert Jones and Agnes Hunt, is it? Uh, orthopedic Hospital in Shrewsbury in UK. So, a uh, great pleasure to um, welcome Peter, who's going to be talking on the history of the life force. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Right, thank you. Now, I didn't go to Dunedin Medical School, and neither have I lectured here. And so I do appreciate the fact that uh, you fellows allow me to join your Dunedin Medical History Society, because you get to hear some interesting lectures. And so I felt I ought to contribute something, a uh, talk. And Terence did say he would like to collect some curiosities. So, <laughs> history of the life force. This is a curiosity. Now, this is not a this is not um, a history of evolution, evolution of animals, and evolution of plants, because David Attenborough has done that beautifully. It's the analogy is talking about the history and evolution of a computer program. The computer is merely the host. For the life force, animals, you and I, are merely the host for the life force. So, sounds a bit esoteric. So uh, let's start with our feet firmly on the ground. It's a bit esoteric, life force, so let's start with our feet firmly on the ground or close to the ground. This is an aerial view of the Robert Jones Agnes Hunt. It's a tertiary orthopedic hospital in Oswestry, Shropshire. Uh, we love history in this place. This was founded in 1900 by Dame Agnes Hunt. She was an orthopedic surgeon and in 1904, so Robert Jones became the uh, chief surgeon here at the Robert Jones Agnes Hunt Hospital. Here is an early ward in those early days at Bass Church. It looks pretty old fashioned and uh, the place has improved since then. Here are four, we have, here's four operating theatres, modern operating theatres. We call it the barn, the barn system, because there's one, there's one great big room in which there are four separate operating theatres. You can see them here. Each one is separated by four glass walls suspended from the ceiling, not touching the ground. They stop about a metre off the ground because each theatre has its own sterile filtered air supply through the ceiling, down over the operating table and out under the suspended walls. It's a positive pressure clean area for operating. It's an orthopedic theater. We were super, super careful about not getting any infection in. And as you can see, the anesthetists and the anesthetic equipment are outside the operating theater we, to, to, to help decrease the risk of infection. You can see these mobile, these mobile bar, these mobile beams here. These are the mobile anesthetic beams. The anesthetic ventilators and monitors are on the beam outside the theatre, as are the anaesthetists. The patients are anaesthetized outside here in anaesthetic rooms, and then they're wheeled in, anaesthetized already on the table into the operating theatre. And the anaesthetist and everybody else stays outside. Here's a, another closer view. You can see that the um, X-ray machine, the, the monitors and stuff, everything that can be is outside the operating theatre. These are operating theatres. Whatever type of operating theatre you work in, there's one common factor. Operations do eventually come to an end. So there we go. Come to an end. Now, uh, right. So that's medicine. That's surgery. So medicine. We've, we've all been to medical school. Five years. A lot to learn. But really, there's really only three things you need to know for medicine. Anatomy, how the body's built, physiology, how it works, and therapeutics, how to fix it when it goes wrong. There's only three. But if you really want to know how it works, 
you've got to read a little bit of biochemistry. This is the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation in Oklahoma City in the USA. And there was a biochemical team there led by this man, Paul B. McKay, and he was studying electron transport processes in membranes. And we were the first ones to show the enzymic production of a free radical by a biological system. We're not talking nuclear reactors. Biological systems can produce free radicals. Four quick slides to demonstrate the process. Here is a microsomal membrane or a mitochondrial in a membrane. It oxidizes PPNH, NADPH, to produce a free radical, which damages the membrane lipids, which, which damage the membrane lipids, causing loss of membrane function. It damages the lipids by oxidizing the, this middle beta fatty acid of the phospholipid. We can measure the rate of loss of the unsaturated fatty acid. We can measure the rate of utilization of TPNH. We can measure, we did measure oxygen uptake and malonaldehyde production, a breakdown product of the unsaturated fatty acids. Fatty acids. These were enzymic pro processes. If we added enzyme inhibitors like PCMB, paratoromethylbenzoate, the reaction stopped. If you added free radical trappers, such as DPA, diphenylamine, the reaction stopped. It was an enzymic production of free radicals. And the fourth slide, the most interesting one, is that if you give alpha tocopherol, vitamin E, to the rats that donate the mitochondria, the membranes are protected. Down at, down at the bottom here, these rats were given extra doses of vitamin E and the membranes were protected for a while till the vitamin E was peroxidized, damaged, and then the reaction carried on. So vitamin E protected the mitochondrial function from free radicals. I wanted to introduce free radicals at this stage because we shall be talking a bit about them. Okay. So there we go. Medicine at the top, biochemistry, now mitochondria. But what makes the mitochondria works? What makes the mitochondria go? What is the life force? that uh, makes it work. And so this is a history of the life force and a complication. It is, of course, a story of electrons finding their way home, slowing down the electron transport chain, releasing energy as it goes. But this is a little trite. It's actually the flow of protons, which is significant in life. But it's easier to think at the beginning as a flow of electrons. So we're going to talk about the origin and the history of this life force using geology, physics, chemistry, and then biochemistry. A few score years ago, when we were all keen young medical students, a good few year, score years ago for some of us, we were taught that life started in a primordial soup. This was a Miller-Urey experiment and theory. And the idea was, of course, that um, the Earth had uh, reduced gases, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen, and bolts of lightning activated these chemicals to form together to form early biochemicals. And in fact, his experiment, he used um, electrodes to produce a spark, and he did collect amino acids at the bottom. Amino acids were collected in the Miller-Urey experiment. But that, we don't think, is how life started now. That's what we were taught back in those days. This is a Campbell soup can containing primordial soup. It is very, very rare. It doesn't exist. Life didn't start in the primordial soup. It started here on the sea floor with alkaline vents and black smokers. These are natural geological structures formed naturally by a restless planet. They emerge from a disequilibrium. This was supposed to go bum, 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 bum at a time. They emerge from a disequilibrium of the restless planet. Magma, tectonic plates move. Magma meets seawater, superheated steam. Great mounds of magma come up and solidify, forming magma rocks, throwing out bits of magma over the seafloor. And these are the black smokers. They are 250 to 400 degrees centigrade, and they're acidic. 
there is, they, they, they throw out, the dissolved metals are spread out over the seabed, and things such as ferrous sulfide and nickel clusters, they have biochemical catalytic properties. Some firms actually went to sort of try and mine these uh, metals close to black smokers. I don't know how they got on. So here in the middle is gregite, which is an inorganic metal, inorganic ore, with its nickel sulfur iron clusters, very similar to those seen in enzymes around it. Now, here is your black smoker. If you click on it now. Black smokers on the sea floor bring up valuable raw materials from inside the earth. Their meter-high vents seem to give off clouds of smoke-like underwater industrial chimneys. Hydrothermal vents occur on the boundary of the tectonic plates all over the world. Here, seawater flows into the ocean floor through cracks. At a depth of two to three kilometers, this water is heated up and then rises to the surface under great pressure. On the way up, the pH and the oxygen content of the water decrease. The resulting aggressive and up to 400 degrees Celsius hot fluid leaches out various elements from the surrounding rock. When coming in contact with the cold seawater, minute particles are formed, causing the escaping water to look like smoke. In the vicinity, substances are deposited and vents are formed. Not theory, they exist. Now, they, they were formed by magna, magma. Olivine is a primary component of the Earth's crust. It's not magma, it's from the mantle. And serpentization, serpentization is a spontaneous exothermic hydration of olivine to form serpentine and hydrogen, hydroxyl radical, and methane. That is a, it produces heat. It's an it's a exothermic natural reaction which occurs. These are rocks, so it's slow. It's a very slow process, and it slowly produces serpentine. And these are your alkaline hydrothermic vents made from mantle rock. The alkaline, the alkaline hydrothermal vents have the requirements for life. They're warm, 50 to 90. They're alkaline. There's a high flux of carbon atoms through it, up it. And these are physically channeled over inorganic catalysts, courtesy of the black smokers. And here, hydrogen can reduce CO2 to formic acid and simple carbohydrates. Here is your black smoker. Here is your alkaline vent. Then, at the turn of the millennium, scientists aboard the submersible Atlantis stumbled across... Turn of the millennium. This is stuff we didn't have in med school. Well, not my med school when I was there. ...across exactly this kind of vent around 15 kilometers from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge on an underwater mountain that also happened to be called the Atlantis Massif. Inevitably named Lost City after the mythic metropolis, its delicate white pillars and fingers of carbonate reaching up into the inky blackness made the name eerily appropriate. The vent field was unlike any other yet discovered. Some of the chimneys were as tall as the black smokers, the largest dubbed Poseidon standing 60 meters proud. But far from being stolidly robust structures, these delicate fingers were ornate as Gothic architecture, full of vacuous doodles, in John Julius Norwich's words. Here, the hydrothermal exhalations were colorless, giving the impression that the city had been suddenly deserted and preserved for all time in its intricate Gothic splendor. No hellhole of black smokers 
These were delicate white non-smokers, their petrified fingers reaching for heaven. It's a thin walled structure. Here are these very thin walls of the serpentine rock. They contain microtubules and vacuoles, very narrow ones, as you can see. And carbon dioxide reduces, is reduced by hydrogen to form formaldehyde and onwards. And, the, and the thermophoresis is the concentration. The small biochemical compounds are formed. They, they ascend in the slow alkaline flow upwards. And then when it reaches colder, colder areas at the, at the top or the edge, the nucleotides, the biochemical molecules, come down and precip precipitate down and concentrate. They're concentrated. They're not washed away. Now, this is Nick Lane. He is a... He is a a biochemist, University College Hospital, and his subject is uh, evolutionary biology, but evolutionary biochemistry, Nick Lane. And he has built, their team has built, this bench top reactor, which is a, a form of, it's, it's meant to simulate the alkaline vent. In, in the bottom part here, he has a, a, a ceramic he has a porous ceramic compound, which is doped with nickel and sulfur. And up it, he pushes um, an alkaline fluid, and it's surrounded by slightly acidic fluid as well. I've got the fluid stuff written down there. And so it simulates an alkaline vent. And it has input at the bottom, output at the top, sampling tubules halfway through, all the way up. And he found... Here, just putting hydrogen in with CO2 on the outside. Oh, first he demonstrated thermophoresis actually occurs with um, fluorescent quinone. It, it, it's concentrated. But more interestingly, he actually found formaldehyde. Formaldehyde was produced. And then in a separate experiment, if he injected formaldehyde into the bottom of this reactor, he could detect the product. He could detect at, at the top glyceraldehyde, erythrose. God, you could, he could detect um, further biochemical compounds. This is in his bench top reactor, an artificial alkaline vent. But what is the force? Here's the, the lecture. What is the force that drives these chemical reactions? It's the pH gradient between the acidic ocean and the alkaline fluids. Hydrogen at pH seven will not reduce CO2 at pH 7, but hydrogen at pH 10 can. Here is a, what do we call it, reduction potential graph. Hydrogen at pH 7 will not reduce CO2 at pH 7. It uh, requires energy. But at pH 10 and CO2 at pH 6, hydrogen will reduce CO2 to formaldehyde, to formic acid and formaldehyde. So it's the pH gradient that allows hydrogen to start producing small compounds. Interesting enough, the pH difference across these inorganic membranes, about three, is the same as those in an autotrophic cell, about three units. So I call this the first stage of the life force. It's a chemical pH gradient is the driving force across a semi-permeable inorganic, inorganic Inorganic stuff, it's geochemical, inorganic. Hydrogen can reduce CO2 to formic acid and then formaldehyde because it's got the nickel, it's got the catalytic centers. And fluid flow upwards prevents accumulation of charge and thermophoresis concentrates. It's a geochemical force. This is the first stage. It's a geochemical force. So over millions of years, it's produced all these small little biochemical compounds. And this process is more gentle continuous and persistent than the primordial theory of lightning. So over these millions of years, occasionally some useful molecules are formed. Fatty acid was one of them. Fatty acids are formed. And as we know, fatty acids can combine spontaneously with a hydroxyl group on a glyceraldehyde, as can phosphate. And all of a sudden, you've got a phospholipid molecule. And as we know, phospholipids spontaneously form membranes. And in those membranes, peptides can orientate themselves. 
And so we have membranes, potential for membranes being formed in these alkaline vents. The amino acid cysteine can collate an iron nickel sulfur cluster, and therefore the membrane doesn't have to be attached to the alkaline vent anymore. It's got its own catalytic center. And the idea is that these membranes detached from the alkaline vent, they've got their own catalytic center. They form little balloon-like protocells, but they don't have a proton gradient. Nothing's going to work. There's no life force. There's no proton gradient. We're aware of passive transport proteins. They just facilitate solute across a membrane down a, a gradient. And we're aware of energy-driven transport proteins, the sodium pump. Energy will cause a conformational change of the proton and pump a sodium ion across the membrane. A hydrated proton, H3O+, plus, is the same size as a sodium ion. So the idea is that a proton pump is very similar to, as we know, the well-known sodium pump. Now, bacteria, present-day bacteria, can do acetogenesis. They can make hydrogen and CO2 form acetate and produce energy. The archaea cells, the other primitive life form, can reduce CO2 to methane. They can have methanogenesis and produce energy. And the theory is that some of these early protocells had the protein molecules that catalyzed methanogenesis and acetogenesis. The, the, the reagents are CO2 and hydrogen. They're present. And they, they contain some proteins, eventually produce some peptides that catalyze that reaction to produce energy, which could activate the proton pump and pump out the proton. So now we have what I call the second stage of life force. The life force is now in a membrane. It's a pH gradient across a membrane. Further biochemical can be formed. It's small molecules of a, of a Krebs cycle. There are four things which are common to every living cell. Four things. One of them is the Krebs cycle. Every living cell has a Krebs cycle. The other three we'll come to in a minute. So halfway, well done, halfway summary, the first stage was geochemical, naturally occurring alkaline vents, inorganic biochemicals, thermophoretic concentration. The second stage of the life force, the pH gradient, is now across a membrane, which have detached from the vents. They've got their own catalytic centers, and they can produce energy. It's, an, it's anaerobic energy. This is a halfway, well done, you're halfway. The third stage is the development of photosynthesis. A brand new, some of, the, some of the proteins that are sensitive to light activated electrons. And so the, the electron chain had a big push at the beginning, activated electrons were pushed down the electron chain. There's a big increase at the beginning of the electron chain, electron transport chain. The third stage of photosynthesis, the third stage of life force. These are the stromatolites. A cyanobact cyanobacteria were the first organisms to have a photosynthetic apparatus molecule. And these are the stromatolites in Shark Bay in Australia. And they are rocky formations of layer upon layer upon layer of generations of cyanobacteria just lying there, sitting there, slowly producing oxygen and photosynthesizing. This led to the great oxidation event. The slowly oxygen was produced. It mass poisoned the anaerobes and it allowed aerobic metabolism to develop. Over 200 to 300 million years, this, these cyanobacteria slowly oxidized the ocean minerals. It was called the rusting of the earth. It displaced the atmospheric methane. It reduced gases up there. Methane, um, what do you call it? Climatic change. Heating the earth. Forgot my name. Anyway. It is one of those gases. And it led to the ice age because the methane was pushed out. It led to the ice age. Vast time scale. No need to go through it. Four and a half billion years. Four and a half billion years the earth was formed. Um, the life force started about here. 
Uh, our origin of life is about there, isotopes, so you're seeing phosphorus chromatolites, the great oxidation event, first fossilized eukaryotes, and then the Cambrian explosion of dinosaurs. So that's time scale. That's that time scale. So aerobic metabolism now occurred. Oxygen is a much better acceptor than all the things previously like, like ferrous ions and arsenates. Much more, it really sucks the electrons from the end of the cytochrome chain. Anaerobic glycolysis produces two ATP. If the pyruvate is oxidized all the way to CO2, it produces 38 ATP. It's a massive increase in efficiency of the life force. So the fourth stage of the life force is aerobic metabolism. But what changed the world from a unicellular bacteria-like slime covering the world? What changed it to make individual free moving animals that we know of nowadays? It is, of course, the endosymbiosis when an archaea cell engulfed a mitochondrial cell 1967, Lynn Margulis theory. And these mitochond these, these, membra these bacteria, engulfed bacteria, became mitochondria with an inner and an outer membrane. They had their own membrane and presumably the outer membrane from the invagination into the archaea cells. And this was a massive improvement in energy production and storage. It allowed the eukaryotes to grow and evolve compared to the prokaryotes, even though they had massive, amazing biochemistry and could live almost anywhere. It was the formation of mitochondria, the fifth stage, no more than five, hang in there, the fifth stage of the life force, a new, a new host to the life force. This is the mitochondria, as we know, we know, there's the electron transport chain. It has a new host, the mitochondria itself. So what's the big deal about mitochondria? This thing, this, this should go slowly show one, two, three of us. It's chemiosmosis. It has two membranes. There's your electron transport chain showing, uh, pushing the elect. There's the electron transport chain, moving electrons over towards the form water, oxygen to water, and protons are pumped out, and then they drive the ATPase. The big deal about it is it's got two membranes. In a single membrane structure, the protons on the outside of the membrane, they can be diluted. They can be lost in the outside world, the ocean, or the cytosol around them. Here, this, the protons are not lost. They're kept and they're concentrated. And this is the chemiosmotic theory, which was described by Peter D. Mitchell in 1961, the chemiosmotic hypothesis. And he got a Nobel Prize for it in 1978. We live in the information age now. We're all talking about information. We, we think that um, Watson and Crick's double helix molecule and the information, the genetic code, which is wonderful, it, st it uh, allows a cell to remember what proteins it needs to produce to be alive. Great discovery. But so is the chemiosmotic theory, because this is the actual theory of what the life force is. It's the movement of proteins, which are now protons, which are now concentrated and kept across the membrane, producing energy. That is the life force, chemiosmosis. And I think Peter D. Mitchell and his chemiosmotic theory is not emphasized enough. That is the life force. It actually led to the Oxfos Wars. They called them the Oxfos Wars because Peter Mitchell was a bit of a, a belligerent eccentric. Here he is. This man, great man, he was a bit of belligerent eccentric. People used to go along to biochemical federation meetings expecting a punch-up between him and the rest of the audience because he never, he never acknowledged the help of one other fellow, R.G. somebody sitting down there. He never acknowledged any, anybody else. And he, he was a bit of an eccentric. His, his, he had an uncle called, this is History Society, he had an uncle called Sir Geoffrey Mitchell who owned and founded the Wimpy Foundation. The Wimpy Construction Company in the UK was a massive company. It built 300,000 houses in the UK. And during the war, it built 
army depots, naval docks, and airfields. And after the war, it built the um, Heathrow Airport. Big, big company, lots of money. Peter D. Mitchell had money, you know, via his uncle. And he's a bit of a flamboyant chap. During the Second World War, the rigors and shortages of the Second World, World War, he used to drive around Cambridge in a, in a silver Rolls Royce with his shirt open to his waist, long hair down to his shoulder in the wind. He was a flamboyant character. And he was belligerent as well because he didn't recognize things. He had a hard, he eventually had a hard time. He um, suffered from gastric ulcers. He went a bit deaf. He had a botched operation to, to help his hearing, which produced vertigo and tinnitus. He found it difficult to sleep and eventually had a nervous breakdown about the same time as he got his Nobel Prize. So he was an interesting character. Well done. Anyway, this is the third and last video. I'm sure you've seen it. And this is the fifth and last stage of the mitochondria, of uh, the, ho the fifth and last host for the life force. I've, 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 because I'm sure you've probably seen it before, I've edited it and cut it down to make it shorter. So the end of this video really does show how the benefit of the mitochondria. One of the key roles of this membrane oh. is to act as a barrier to positively charged particles called protons thus allowing a concentration gradient to be maintained where the intermembrane space has far more protons than the matrix. The membrane also contains a large protein complex called the F1, F0 ATP synthase, which uses the proton gradient to drive the synthesis of ATP molecules. The protein complexes and small molecules that establish this gradient and maintain it play an essential role in the life of the cell. At the heart of this system are four protein complexes, numbered one through four. Complexes one, three, and four directly pump protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Complex two does not directly pump protons, but it does promote proton pumping in complexes three and four. Proton pumping requires energy, and the four protein complexes get this energy by transferring electrons through a series of coupled reactions. In this animation, we have explored each protein complex in isolation, but in reality, they are very densely packed. Together, they effectively make the entire surface of the inner mitochondrial membrane a giant cellular power plant. That's the point. That's why they're so efficient. The, the life force is really concentrated in the mitochondrial membrane. Um, that's the last video. I did cut it down a touch. So I think it really nicely shows that. So, the mitochondria, but the problem was the, the efficiency of the mitochondria, they continued to increase. Evolution occurred, the mitochondrial efficiency increased. Bacteria lose genes to increase their growth rate, no problem, because if the bacteria needs them again, they get them from somebody else, from another bacteria from bilateral transfer. The mitochondria inside the cell tended to do the same thing. It gave a lot of its genes to the host nucleus. But some of those genes stayed behind in the mitochondria. There are, there are, about, 40, there are about 14 mitochondrial. Some of, the, some, of the, some of the DNA stayed behind in the mitochondria to produce mitochondrial proteins required for respiration. Most went to the nucleus, but some stayed behind. So here we have the crown of biochemical evolution. Chemiosmosis is the mitochondrial double membrane and the double membrane. A busy hive of biochemical flux, the life force. And, but there's a problem. This crown contains a thorn. The thorn is sex. The problem is sex. Isn't it always? 
Mitochondria in the next generation only come via the female oocyte. Most mitochondrial DNA is a nucleus, and that undergoes Darwinian evolution. The DNA in the mitochondria does not. Nuclear DNA undergoes Darwinian, Darwinian evolution, male and female, but the mitochondria does not. It's only female. This gives rise to the mosaic respiratory chain, as it's called, the mosaic respiratory chain. Here, here, here we have um, in, uh, complex one, three, four, and the ATPase. The dark areas are made from mitochondrial genes. The light areas are made from nuclear genes. The mitochondrial genes mutate 50 times faster than the nuclear genes. The nuclear genes are protected by a membrane and histones. The mitochondrial genes are not, they, and they're right by the mitochondria, right by the electron transport chain. Free radicals, we talked about free radicals earlier. Free radicals. The mitochondrial genes can be damaged 50 times faster than the nuclear genes. So there's a potential for the genes, for the, for the proteins in the, in the mosaic respiratory chain not to match. They should match well to work efficiently. If they don't match because half of them mutate 50 times faster, then there's, a ch there's, a, there's the option, there's a possibility of not working well. The mosaic mitochondria requires a different change in mitochondrial nuclear proteins to match well. If not, the mitochondria can become less efficient. Here we have the idea of Top one is mitochondria working fine. This bottom one, they don't work quite so well. The ATPase is not working quite so well as it should do. And so the electrons back up in the electron transport chain and they can be lost as free radicals. This is why we talked about free radicals at the beginning. Here are free radicals probably occur, you know, possibly occurring, probably occurring in mitochondria. Over time, mismatch occurs, DNA, uh, poorly mismatching, does this lead to aging, where you have poorly functioning mitochondria? And a bad mismatch, free radicals would break up the inner mitochondrial membrane, releasing cytochrome C, which actually does, does, is a problem. So here we are, the last stage in the complication. Once again, bit by bit it should be. Increasing mitochondrial efficiency led to the mosaic gen genetic nature of the respiratory proteins. Over time, they become inefficient due to protein mismatch, which leads to aging and a possibly apoptotic, apoptotic cell death. So here we have the five stages of the history of the life force. First, it's geochemical across an inorganic alkaline vent. Then it's biochemical across a membrane, cell membrane. Then there's photosynthesis, great increase at one end. Aerobic metabolism, increase in the life force efficiency, by sucking the electrons at the other end. And then mitochondria as a, as a really, really perfect host, concentrating it even more. And the complication, of course, is the mitochondria. Is the complication is that the mitochondria don't work so well. They, over, they continued to over-evolve and nuclear and mitochondrial genes may not match anymore. So well done. You got it. To, you got to the end. Thank you very much. Questions. I, I've got one to kick off. Um, I'm aware of Lynn Margulis's theory of endosymbiosis. Is that right? Yes. 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 In relation to bacteria uh, gaining um, immunity to pesticides and so on. Gaining uh, immunity to to pesticides. Is that correct? They. Pesticides. They. they engulf one bacterium will engulf mitochondrial uh, dna from another bacterium yes it will give that bacterium immunity to pesticide yes the, the natural transfer of the genetic code from one bacteria to another yes so you're suggesting that that happened really at a very early stage to form more than one cell you said that no no no, no. i'm saying early life the, the very first type of unicellular things that existed that emerged, ribosomal DNA studies have shown, protein studies have shown, are bacteria and archaea. Archaea yes. is, is like a bacteria. It's a single-celled single -celled organism. 
they're genetic they're genetically very different and yeah. pro proteins are very different with no nucleus is that right with without a nucleus yes both of the, yes neither of those neither will have a nucleus you're absolutely right neither have a nucleus and the idea is that an archaea cell ingested a bacteria cell yes and the bacteria cell became the mitochondria ah right i see so, so the dna from the the uh, the eaten bacterium became the dna of the eater in, in, it was transferred to the nucleus of the yes. archaea cell as yes. well yes yes most of it was transferred okay. just a little bit remaining mitochondria thank you that's it <laughs> no, that is that absolutely fascinating where does the gender come in at what stage is there such a thing as male and female because the <clears throat> in evolution yeah why did we have You're the why, why, did it, why did it evolve to form two sexes yeah is that the question what stage did that first appear when did that first appear couldn't tell you offhand I don't know. Very, good, very good question the because the interesting it has been talked about and I have read about it because the story carried on why only two sexes why not three why not four why only two you know if you had two or three sexes you might have more mixing of DNA but the, the answer is I, I don't I can't I can't remember when it when when that came in sorry <laughs> good question another question I've got one more. Um, you're talking about the formation of cell membrane. Okay. I presume that if you're thinking about the formation of a cell, the protoplasm starts off without a membrane. Would that be correct? Like the, the, the substance of the cell is formed and then the membrane around the outside. Is that correct? Or the other way around? No. My impression is that it, it's probably the other way around. In the alkaline vent, biochemical molecules are formed, including those which give rise to a membrane. A membrane blebs off, and some of these little biochem the biochemical sugars and fatty acids and stuff dissolve, um, dissolve into the, the, proto the proto cell. They dissolve in. The cytoplasm, the cytoplasm at that stage is nothing like um, the cytoplasm we have nowadays of. Uh, Structural glycogen, structural, structural bits and yeah. microsomes and membranes. It's just at that early stage, it was just a solution of simple sugars. Yeah, right. That was the start of cytoplasm. Yes. And then a membrane around it. That chap, that biochemist you uh, referred to, who had the ceramic column that he was uh, mimicking in our client Benton. Yeah. Okay. What? chemicals did he produce in that lab at first he produced formaldehyde that was with just I have written down here okay what what al what were in his alkaline solution and what compounds what's what salts were in his acid solution yes. they're, they're pretty irrelevant actually but and they and these solutions he bubbled nitrogen through them for four hours I think it was to make them anaerobic because these alkaline vents nowadays don't work on the seafloor now because our sea our oceans are anaerobic uh, aerobic they only it's, it's, besides the ph gradient it's also it has to be anaerobic uh, he, he found when he made these benchtop reactors they had to be anaerobic totally oxygen stopped the reaction yeah hi uh, thank you for that it's been brilliant i um just on that last point, there, there wasn't. Um, I was interested in your timeline. Um, at one stage, of course, on the, on the planet, there was no ocean. Sorry, couldn't quite hear. And no. another time, there was there was no salinity in the no. ocean. So those two things have happened. I'd like to know where they are on your timeline: the formation of ocean and the formation of the sal salinity of the ocean. I forget my earth sciences. Sorry. Right. I don't really know. I, I, my, my story starts, there is an ocean, there's, 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 there's air, land, and there is an ocean. So I don't know when the water starts. And in fact, Terry Terence was talking at the U3A meeting about some people who wrote in ancient history, the whole earth was covered by water at one time, and earth emerged, out, land emerged out of it. 
I, I, don't, I don't know when and how the water is formed. Does anyone else know that? <laughs> yes. Very, cl very close. Good evening. Uh, my question is about, uh, we talk about the emergence of life on Earth, the life force. You don't talk anything about uh, the magnetic field, how it impacts on Earth, for example, on Mars or Moon, for example, no life can sustain because there's no magnetic field. So this is the first impulse of life, isn't it? Is this about, is the possibility of life being formed on other planets? Is that the question? Yes. Oh. So that's I'm talking about Earth or planet, no life without a magnetic field. There's no life, no cellular level. Very sorry, I'm a little bit hard of hearing. I can't understand the question. Does the magnetic field have any effect on it? I do not know. I do not know. I thought you were going to say, could there be life on other planets? And the answer is, if there is, we, don't, we shouldn't think about it in terms of little green Martians and little men on spaceships. Under, un, I know you didn't ask that, but I'm going to say it anyway. Any planet that has water, rock, and gases such as hydrogen, CO2, and methane, the reduced gases, there's the potential for these stru geological structures to form. And it doesn't have to be water. There might be another planet with completely different um, pressure, temperature, as long as it's got some form of liquid, solid and gas, that can react together, form a pH gradient, some form of life form could exist under the ocean, for all we know. Sorry, I've told your question. Another question? Okay, if there are no more questions, could I ask everyone to join me in thanking Peter for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.